Welcome back guys, this is Travis here with Fisher Hex. Appreciate you stopping in for another video. Today is part six in our beginner guide question series, and we're gonna talk about reverse osmosis deionization systems, also known as RODI units. At the end of the video, I'm gonna talk about some upcoming subscriber contest giveaways, so let's go ahead and get started. Okay, number one, what is an RODI system and what is it used for? Now we're trying to keep this answer brief so we can move on to the rest of the video, but to sum it up, it is a multi-stage filter between four to eight stages usually that you pump your tap water through and this removes the uh, organic compounds, heavy metals and all that stuff out of the water. Basically at the end of the filter you're going to have zero TDS which is total dissolved solids. This is what you want to add to your reef tank. By doing that you're not introducing phosphates or like copper or any other heavy metals to your reef tank that could potentially kill the coral and cause issues with water quality. So having an RLDI unit definitely allows you to have the purest water possible for your reef. All right, number two, what is the best way to go about connecting my RO unit to my house? Now, if you own your property, you can go ahead and tap it into a copper line and preferably the cold end. You don't want to be getting into any hot water with this system, but uh, you can go ahead and put it in your copper line. It pretty much punches a hole, allows you to connect the quarter inch RO tubing. But if you're in an apartment like me, it's best to get the uh, screw on adapter that goes underneath the sink, just basically bridging the gap between the uh, input from the copper line to the hose that goes to the uh, faucet itself. Basically, it bridges that gap and allows you to connect the quarter inch RO tubing. Now, if you don't want to do either one of these, your next option is the faucet end adapter. I highly recommend you get the metal one opposed to the plastic just because it will last longer. It does cost a little bit more money, but uh, understand that the plastic will eventually start leaking and then you'll have uh, you know pressure jets of water squirting out the top. And I dealt with it for a while. I put a towel over it and uh, it was just annoying. So. If you're not going to hard plumb it underneath the sink or into your copper line, get the metal faucet adapter and do it that way. Okay, number three, how many stages should I have in my RO system and what are they? Now, I recommend you have no less than four stages and this is the reason why. Your first one is going to be a sediment filter. It actually collects all the small particles as water comes into the system and this actually prevents the carbon block and the RO membrane from clogging prematurely, extending the life of both of those filters. Now the next one is going to be your activated carbon or GAC filter and this actually absorbs uh, dissolved compounds like chlorine, chloramine, and copper and gets that stuff out of the system. The next filter in the chain is going to be your RO membrane. This is the one that's going to produce the most wastewater which I believe is uh, four gallons of wastewater per one gallon of actual water that continues onto the filter and this filters by removing molecules that are larger and heavier than the water. Now the final stage of filtration is your uh, DI, which actually cleanses the water via ion exchange. I have a whole video on DI resin and how it works. You can check that out. I will link it in the description below. But that's pretty much what I recommend as a minimum for your RODI system. Now I personally like to run a single sediment filter, two carbon blocks, an RO membrane, and two DIs. Now that's basically what works best for my uh, current incoming TDS from my apartment. But uh, we'll see when I move to the next place what the TDS is because I'll make adjustments based on that. Okay, number four, how often should I change my RO membrane? Now they say they can last between one to two years. It really depends on what your incoming TDS is and how many pre-filters you have before you get to the RO membrane. Now you can definitely um, see what kind of TDS is coming off the RO membrane with a meter and kind of make a decision from there. But personally, I just go ahead and change it every January. All right, number five, how often should I change my sediment filter? Now because your sediment filter is the first one in the chain, it's going to get the brute force of whatever's in your tap water. Now I recommend you put it in a clear canister that connects to the RODI unit. That way you can visually see how dirty it becomes over time. Now I personally just change mine out when it becomes a full rusty looking color and, uh, and it seems to work out fine for me. There really is no set schedule. Just keep an eye on it and, uh, and basically change as needed. Okay, number six, how often should I change my carbon blocks? Now this is gonna be determined by how many carbon blocks you have and what your incoming TDS is. Now I personally have two carbon blocks and I just change them every six months on the dot. I don't really play with what can I get out of my filter, how long can I have it run for. Uh, basically, I just change it on the schedule so I can continue to have good water all the time. Okay, number seven, how do I know when it's time to change my DI resin? Now there's two ways to do this. The easiest one is to get the color changing DI resin. You can pick it up at Bulk Reef Supply. And basically what I do personally is I have two DI canisters. I fill them both up with the resin. As it's being used, it's gonna go from a blue color to a brown colorish. And then that tells you pretty much when it's used up. Now what I like to do is when, it, when the first canister is used up and I get about halfway through the second one, I'll go ahead and swap the canisters, fill up the old one with new DI resin and continue to use it and just do the swap as needed. That way I always have good water coming out of my DI resin. 
Okay, the second way you can determine if your DI resin has been depleted is to measure the total dissolved solids or TDS coming out of that filter. Now you can simply use a HANA held or an inline system that I have, and this actually leads into question eight, which is what is a TDS meter and how should I install one? Now, if you wanna measure to see if your DI resin has been depleted, you simply just wanna test and uh, if you're using the handheld, you can just test the water coming out, make sure it reads zero all the time. Now, if you're using the inline, you're going to connect the output to the output of that filter and just see what's coming out. Like I said, if it's over zero, you definitely want to change out that filter media. Personally, I like to use the dual TDS meter. I still keep the output after the DI resin just to see if there's any kind of TDS creep. Now, what I do is I take the input, which is the red, and I like to put it after the RL membrane. Now, what this does is it allows me to see what kind of TDS creep I get once the system turns on, but I also can see what it settles at. Now, I use this to determine when I need to change my filters if they need to be changed before the six month period. Now, what happens is after about three hours of running, it usually drops down to about two TDS. Now, say I don't change my uh, RL membrane or my GAC filters or something's going on that's causing the filters to get dirtier quickly. I will start seeing that the TDS coming off the RO membrane will actually creep up to like 9, 10, 15, 20. At that point, I know that something needs to be changed in those filters so I can actually get better filtration before it goes in to the DI resin. Now what you'll find out is the higher TDS going into the DI resin, the less life that that DI resin will have. And unfortunately, if you're dropping 20 or 30 TDS off the RO membrane into your DI resin, that don't expect that resin to last very long, that's for sure. Okay, number nine, what is a booster pump and when should I add one? Now a booster pump simply just takes your water pressure, increases it and gets it in the appropriate range for the RO system. Now it's gonna depend on where you live, if you're on a well, if you're on the city, and sometimes you know the connection that you have just doesn't have enough water pressure to be able to power the system in the correct range. Now if you have below 40 PSI, you definitely wanna add a booster pump. If you have higher than 80 or 90 PSI, you need to figure out a way to lessen that PSI before you crack the actual system. But the recommended range for a RODI system is usually between 50 or 70 PSI. Okay, this actually leads us into question 10, and that is, should I add a pressure gauge to my RO system? And the answer is absolutely. A lot of systems already come with them, but if yours doesn't, for whatever reason, you can pick one up relatively cheap offline. Now, what you want to do is you want to connect it on the water line going in to the RO membrane, because you want to know what kind of pressure is going on that RO membrane. And then, uh, you know, if you make adjustments as needed, like I said, below 40, get a booster pump, higher than 80 or 90, you might want to start restricting the flow going into the RO system. And of course, between 50 and 70, you're good to go. Okay, number 11, do I need to have a flush valve? Now there's a lot of debate up on the forums. I'm not really going to get into that. But personally, I do have one on my RO system. What it allows you to do is to pretty much take the restriction off the water coming into the system. And what it does is it allows you to flush water over the RO membrane very quickly, uh, potentially removing any gunk or buildup on it, prolonging the life of that RO membrane. Now, does it work? I really haven't been using one long enough to know. I've had it for about a year or so. And honestly, because I change my RO membrane every year, I really can't give you an answer if it works or not. You might want to hit the Google button and see what other people think. But personally, why not? I mean, it, it's not going to hurt the system. It can only benefit it. So why not get one? All right, number 12, what can I do with all the wastewater from my RODI system? Now, because there's about four gallons to one gallon ratio, that is a lot of water that's going down the drain. Some people add a second membrane, which allows you to uh, use that water and get more out of it. Now, some other options you have is you can uh, have it go out into your garden, water your plants with it. Understand that the water coming out of the waste tube is actually gonna have a higher mineral content than it, when it originally went in. So just keep that in mind. The second thing you can do if you have the option is get some tubs and just have your wastewater go into those tubs and you can actually pump it into your uh, washer so you can clean your clothes with it. So that's a good way to save water. I mean, you're just washing clothes, so it's not really a big deal. It doesn't need to be purified water. And again, if it has a higher mineral count, who really cares? So those are just a couple options that you have to do uh, with your wastewater. Okay, number 13. This is actually a pretty common question and that is, can I drink my RODI water? Now the answer is you can drink the RO portion of it, but don't drink anything after the DI. Now the reason for this is the body just doesn't do well drinking ultra pure water, and that's exactly what's coming out of the DI. Now it's been known to actually remove nutrients and minerals from the body, and it just causes more issues than it's worth. So I highly recommend if you wanna drink RO water, go ahead and get a separate RO system. I personally have two. One that actually stores the water in like a four gallon canister, and then there's a little nozzle that goes uh, up at the sink where you can just get RO water that way. Now, so I have one for drinking at home, and then I have a separate system for my fish tanks. 
Okay, number 14, how long can I store RODI water? Now it's really gonna come down to what you're storing your water in. Now if you're just using gallon jugs from the store, that's probably not gonna be a good long-term use just because those types of plastics start leaching back into the water. But if you get a, a BPA-free, you know, one of those brew trash cans from Home Depot or Lowe's, that are, uh, you know, that are good plastic. I know that what you can do is look at the symbol and it will tell you what the type of plastic that container is made out of. I highly recommend you do some research on that before purchasing anything. But I've been using brute trash cans for a long time and actual uh, professional water storage containers. And uh, I have no issues with that. I have stored water up to a month before using it. Like I said, it's really going to come down to what you're storing the water in. All right, number 15, this is going to be the last question in this video, and that is, do I need to keep my stored RODI water at the same temperature of my tank? And the answer to that question is absolutely not. Unless you are saving up salt water for an emergency, you might want to keep that at temperature because that would make it so you can use it immediately if something was to go wrong. But if you're just storing RODI water and then you transfer it to another container or you just mix it in that container with salt every couple weeks to be able to do your water changes, there's really no reason to keep it at temperature. Personally, what I like to do is transfer the water I'm going to use from my regular RODI water to my saltwater bin about three days before I do my water change, mix the salt, have the pump in there, and add the heater. That way it's ready to go when it's time to do the water change. Well, guys, that's about it for this video. I hope you found it to be helpful. Now, this topic was actually suggested a couple times, so if you have any ideas on future topics, feel free to put it in the comment section below so I can make those videos and get them out in a timely manner. Now, as for upcoming subscriber contests, we're going to start again at 6K, as I mentioned in the previous video. And then I'm going to do one every 500 from that point until I'm done with YouTube, whenever that might be. Now, what I'm going to do for those of you who are in the United States, I'm going to be doing a $100 promo code gift card for my website. Basically, that's going to allow you to get five frags plus shipping for free at the minimum. You can simply put whatever you want in the cart, add this promo code, and it will take $100 off of your uh, purchase. So hopefully that will be good for those of you who live in the United States. Now, I still haven't figured out what I'm going to do for those of you who outside the United States. I will figure something out. I still have, I think, 500 subscribers or something like that to figure that out. But I'll let you know when we get there. All right. Either way, guys, if I hope you liked the video. If you did, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe for more, and I'll see you next time. Peace.